with sustainability, we look at humankind's impact on the natural environment. And in resiliency, we look at the environment, the natural environment's impact on the built world. Welcome to the Architect My Life podcast. I'm Aya Schlachter, your host, CEO of MGS Global Group, supporting architecture and design firms. We provide BIM modeling and drafting services to overwhelmed architects and design firm owners. On my podcast, I talk to successful women firm owners and entrepreneurs to discuss their challenges, share our experiences, and above all, celebrate each other's success. My core business, MGS Global, started as a part-time gig when I was a new mom. It has now grown to a thriving business, providing architectural support to the creatives, which helps everyone maintain a healthy work-life balance. The Architect My Life podcast is where I hope you learn to achieve your goals through genuine stories and conversations with other successful women in the industry. Now let's dive into this episode. Hi everyone, our guest this week is Dina Prastos. As founder and CEO of Indigo River, Dina is the first waterfront architect trailblazing a new category in the industry. Indigo River is a woman-owned transdisciplinary design firm focused on progressive waterfront architecture, resiliency, and climate adaptation. A leading authority in New York Harbor and beyond, the firm specializes in climate adaptation through waterfront solutions that seamlessly transcend boundaries, guiding and executing projects from ideation through final construction and operations. Waterfront architect, civil engineer, futurist, climate adaptation expert, entrepreneur, and creative original, Dina is driven to transform the built world at the water's edge. I'm so thrilled to talk to her today. Welcome to the show, Dina. Hi, Aya. Thank you for having me. My pleasure to be here. I'm so excited because you have done so much in your last, I don't know how many years, because you look pretty young. So (laughs) tell me about your childhood in Alaska and what was your childhood like growing up? Incredibly active. I um, I have two brothers and all of us, I feel like my poor mother was split her time between carting us all to athletics or music or academics. So we all played a musical instrument. We all played at least one sport every season. Um, And then academics were kind of first and foremost that we weren't allowed to go to our practices unless our homework was done. Um, But Alaska was really a great place to grow up. Um, Certainly immersed in the outdoors. Our summers were usually, uh, other than sports, we would spend a lot of time camping and hiking and fishing and just doing things out in nature. And the summers there are stunning and beautiful and the sun doesn't set until if at all, 11, midnight. Um, So you get a lot of daylight. Is that all year round? In the summers. The winters alternatively are are dark and and cold, but um, you can tell I'm a summer baby and I love the summer. (laughs) That's great. So are you originally from Alaska? Are you Greek? I am Greek, 100% Greek. My uh, my mother immigrated over with my father. Uh, my father's also Greek, but second generation. My dad was born and raised in New York. My mom was born and raised in Sparta, Greece. Oh, wow. Uh, and they ended up in Alaska, and it was supposed to be, you know, a one or two year thing and ended up being 40 plus years and three kids later, and they're still up there, <laughs> although they travel more now. <laughs> I was always curious about Alaska because every time I go home to the Philippines, we always had a layover in Alaska. Yep. But I've never met anyone from Alaska, and you're the first. <laughs> well, I was, yeah, I was born and raised there, and it's a great place to grow up. The high school I went to is the most diverse high school in the country, so that's also uh, pretty special. In Alaska, the most diverse high school in the country. That's yes. interesting. Yep. So I don't know if you know this, but I'm Filipino, and this month is Filipino Heritage Month. So do you know other Filipinos? Yes, one of my very best friends growing up was Filipina, and she, uh, we played soccer together, we went to college together, uh, one of my very, very dear close friends still. So we, That's would, awesome. we would take our soccer breaks and go to her house and have pensit and enjoy our oh. bibinka. And <laughs> I can't loved believe it you just said that. <laughs> I did a podcast episode with three Filipinas, and we did... Uh, you know, top six things about being Filipino. What's your favorite food? Pancit. What's your favorite dessert? Bibinka. Yep. Exactly what you said. So you could be Filipino. <laughs> By adoption, yes. We grew yeah. up in each other's home. So she also knew the uh, the Greek baklava and the pasitsa or whatever my mom would make. We would, you know, exchange leftovers and, and enjoy each other's family meals. <laughs> oh, my God. I actually was in Greece for the first time over the summer. 
Oh, just fantastic. to, um, yeah, just for four days. But I love Greece so much. <laughs> well, the Philippines also are beautiful. I've been to um, a couple places and really enjoyed it. Just stunning, gorgeous beaches. You have been to the Philippines? I have. Oh, wow. Where? Uh, so what is, oh, I'm blanking on the name of the island. It'll come to Baracay me. or Palawan. Baracay. Baracay. Yeah. yeah. Everybody goes to Baracay. So, <laughs> so tell me what was your most memorable experience that you, that involved nature? Because you're obviously, we'll talk later on about being a waterfront architect, but what, when you were a child, how did you, you know, what was your relationship towards nature? So we had a stream in my backyard that, I mean, any time of year we'd go outside, even in the dead of winter, and we'd go and see the, the water flowing and some parts would be frozen over, but always just with endless curiosity, exploring the, the stream bed. Um, and that was on a, you know, regular basis throughout my childhood and, until I left for, for college. Um, but in particular, I can remember, I mean, a handful of camping trips and things. One, uh, the summer I turned 14, I went with my dad and we went down the Yukon River just camping on the riverbed for two weeks um, and it was around summer solstice so it was eerie in that it didn't have a traditional su traditional sunrise and sunset the sun just kind of circled the horizon and it was hard to keep track of time and I think I've got the darkest I've ever been in my life tan wise just because that you know sun didn't set it wasn't super strong but it was constant um, so certainly remember uh, exploring riverbeds and stream beds throughout my childhood and anytime we would travel whether to Greece to see family or not uh, we'd go to you know coastlines and shorelines and just remember much of our time was spent on the water near the water well, first of all I commend you for being in the woods for two weeks <laughs> I, I I did camping and two days was enough <laughs> um, so who was the person or situation or event that inspired you to pursue architecture at first because you moved to the u.s i mean you moved to njit right right from from alaska uh no i actually had a, a little bit of an indirect path so i went to university of connecticut for my first year out of school i played soccer division one soccer and i was recruited and the team was phenomenal and i hadn't put the emphasis on my career or academia at that time it was all about you know athletics and division one sports and so uh, I went to University of Connecticut, but I did have in the back of my mind from a young age uh, an appreciation for architecture. My mom certainly had an appreciation for architecture also kind of balancing the arts and the sciences. Um, and so when I was midway through my first year at UConn, um, undergraduate and just kind of generic business degree, I found that I was for the first time, you know, really struggling to stay focused on my academics. And it wasn't that, you know, they were there was anything wrong. It was just that I, I couldn't connect to the content. I couldn't connect to what it was setting me up for and I wasn't excited about it. And so I, uh, second semester against all of my advisor's advice, I pivoted and took any and every course that was even you know peripheral um, related to architecture. So I took art history and drawing classes and landscape architecture classes, just general um, degree, uh, credits that I could transfer if I decided that resonated and it certainly did. Uh, and so then my my search was filtered down to Division One athletics programs where I could still play soccer and, and maybe receive scholarship um, and a five year architecture program where I could finish my undergraduate degree and have the be in a position to be licensed. Um, and so that was a very short list. <laughs> there are surprisingly many, many schools and many coaches that don't allow for architecture to be the the major for Division One athletes. Uh, and maybe that's by nature of, you know, studio environment of all nighters, which I have to say, I never actually ended up pulling up, pulling an all nighter. Um, but there is a, you know, a huge time component for an athletic, for, for a um, architecture student. Were you in a student athlete in NJIT? I was. And I was, was it division one or three? It was division one. So the year I came was actually the year that they were transitioning from division two to division one. Um, and I ended up being a, a three year captain and I even stayed on a year later and was a student coach for the program. Wow. I actually was also in the swim team, but we were division three. So and... they, they, I believe all of the athletics have um, have transitioned now. I, I was actually back on campus uh, a week or two ago. And I received a full tour of the athletics facility and it is beautiful out of this world and state of the art. They have one of those under underwater um, treadmills. It's it's amazing, phenomenal facilities, which were not the case. I mean, they were great when I was there, but now they're at a whole new level. So it's really wonderful to see that. May I ask what year you were there? 
I finished, so I went in 2005 and I finished in 2009 with, um, with two programs. So I did my undergraduate in architecture and I pretty much every summer took classes nonstop. Uh, and then I, I also took a, a master's in civil engineering. So I finished in 2009. Oh my, that that sounds um, scary. <laughs> a, a lot of work. I I was there in '99, so I'm way ahead. But that time I was already impressed by all of their um, the the gymnasium and all that. the facilities. Go yeah, back but now; th- it'll blow your mind. <laughs> okay, I I have to maybe attend one of those. They they always send me postcards for alumni. Yep. So now that I know you and a few other <laughs> amazing women, I might just go. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I really valued my education in NJIT. Um, I learned so much from my four years in NJIT. So, so tell me, what does a waterfront architect do? So, if you think of the think of it as a kind of a type a typology or a, a condition where anytime the water meets something man made, that's what I'll focus on. So that can come in many different forms. It can be a building that's on the water, but generally that interface isn't the building on the water. There'll be a bulkhead or a platform or a, a wharf. Um, it can also be a marina or a port facility. I've done many ferry landings. So it it really depends on what that infrastructure is, and it often ends up being infrastructure, not typically. Uh, am I working on a building per se or a traditional building the way that most architects would? But I'm really looking at um, that condition where nature meets the man-made by form of water and, and whatever the upland condition is. So why waterfront architecture as a specialization? Like I hear people go into tech or like hospitality, but never waterfront architecture. So I'm really excited how you got there. So I didn't set out looking to be a waterfront architect by any means. I, um, one of the first projects I was actually assigned, I was put on, was the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. And at the time, I worked for a contractor, and it was a design-build project. Um, and so I worked on the, the contractor side, but really as a in, a, in the position of a desi- design liaison. So I would be the intermediary, carrying the comments back and forth, and kind of advocating for whoever wasn't in the room, whether it was the designers or the, the contracting and constructing engineers. Um, and there was a lot of... Certainly, it's a very heavy, heavily regulated environment, and so there are scenarios that wouldn't typically be encountered, but as soon as you start to get a grasp of them and are, are able to apply them to other sites that are similar, um, I feel like that in and of itself is appreciated as a specialty. So uh, I do believe New York City waterfront um, or New York, the harbor in, in New York is probably one of, if not the most heavily regulated areas um, in the country, certainly, but perhaps even in the world, because there are so many layers of regulatory review and environmental review that uh, one must go through to develop on the water. And it's not just at a local you know, city level or at a state level, it's also at a federal level as well. And there are just many different agencies with different motivations. So it's a lot to kind of grasp and get your arms around. And then once you start to understand and understand the different motivations, um, that's where I think the the fun starts is to be able to design in that kind of gray space and um, anticipate what the motivations will be and respond to them proactively. So do you do a lot of policy writing and changing or, you know, or design itself or is it half and half? So, I, you know, it's funny that you asked that. I um I don't do a lot of policy writing per se, but I, I do participate actively in a few different committees um, that review and respond and give advice back when policy is in you know draft form for different areas within regulation. Um, but I, it, it's just something, I don't know how your education finished, but when my education finished, I didn't understand the role of the arch- architect to be nearly as political as it is or as it can be. Um, and so certainly even over the weekend, I was reading some policy and uh, my mom asked what I was reading and I told her and she said, is that for fun or what? <laughs> I said, well, I'm, I'm curious. It relates to my work. It's, I don't know whether fun is the right word, but relative and then relevant, um, certainly. Wow, that's exciting. So you talk about biomimicry, ecology and futurism in relation to waterfront architecture. Can you, first of all, can you explain what biomimicry is and the rest as well? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, biomimicry, it's when we look to nature um, and and mimic nature's, whether it's processes or forms. Um, And and we do it a lot, whether subconsciously or not, but it's really, in my mind, appreciating nature and learning from it. Um, So that can be on the level of certainly what something looks like, its form, but often there's some process embedded in the form of why it looks the way it looks and it's getting to the root of that. 
Um, and so that's, you know, taking those cues from nature and applying them to our design principles. Do you have a, a specific project you can share or that, that does this or example so we can visualize it? So uh, I'll give you some example on the ecology front, um, which is okay. also related to natural processes, but ecology is looking at the different species and how they have interdependencies and their intricacies that are intertwined. Um, and so certainly understanding ecologies on the water front, um, I mean, they, there's ecology is embedded everywhere, but that we are the environment, our environment is not just for people, it's for, you know, the planet and, and all of the animals on the planet. And so certainly when we work on the waterfront, when we consider, you know, impact on species and fish species, we're not looking, um, you know, within the limits only of what's on the site when we're on the site, we have to consider all of the migrations, all of the seasonal patterns, the habitats, um, and, and when they spawn and what the conditions need to be. And what we do on one site, while it's, you know, capped by the the bounds of the the meets and bounds of the property site there are many other species that come in and out and it happens with birds and migratory patterns as well it happens with highways when we build and they're you know you can't let the migration patterns be interrupted there there are certain considerations um, but certainly on the waterfront i feel like it is front and center because of we're building in someone else's habitat um, and, and oftentimes whether or not we're encroaching into a river or water body there are impacts even just during the construction um, that affect the habitat of that area so when we look at ecology um, we can think of you know what is our role within this planet and what is our built environment doing to affect the 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 other habitats the other species are we driving them out are we causing you know patterns so that they'll become extinct um, and so other projects that we have, we work uh, currently on the River Ring project for two trees, which there is an ecologist that is a member of our team, but that philosophy kind of gets embedded into every part of the design because we can't go too far without considering and reconsidering the impacts to the other species. And um, in this case, it's a project where it's really looking to celebrate the different ecology and create habitat environments for uh, different different species to thrive. So you collaborate a lot with ecologists. Who else do you collaborate with, you know, in a typical project? Uh, many different disciplines. So even I'll, I'll start with even who the different members of our team are and then certainly who we collaborate with. I, I mean, I have a more traditional background in architecture. I also have a background in civil engineering. We have another um, kind of more typically trained architect and masters in urban planning. Uh, and then beyond that, those are, we're the only two real architects um, in the traditional sense. We do have a landscape architect, we do have city planners, we do have climate adaptation specialists. And then on our engineering side, we have marine engineers, coastal engineers, uh, construction engineers, and we do a lot of the ancillary um, project management and project controls like cost estimating, scheduling, sequencing, logistics, because that's another thing on the waterfront is the the constructability and the means and methods are kind of embedded in the design process because whatever you design, you have to think about how it will be built. And that's something that, um, you know, for traditional sites upland, there's a, an assumed route that materials will take by road and by truck and, and by the water. That's not always the case. Or you have a kind of added flexibility of bringing materials to site by water, which also affects the, the size and scale of components as we design them, that they can come by barge and they don't necessarily need to fit on a truck bed. Um, so it opens up the op opportunity as well for, um, you know, prefabricated elements to be considered earlier in the process um, if, we, if we can, you know, fine tune the logistics. Uh, but I'll get back to the, the root question you had asked, which was, you know, who do we collaborate with? Understanding that we have many different disciplines within our own team. We also collaborate routinely with landscape architects, ecologists, structural engineers, um, architects, traditional architects as well, developers, even environmental attorneys for what can be done or what could be done for means and methods. That's interesting because I have a master's degree in urban design and I actually work in a project where we tried to rehabilitate the sand <laughs> because in the Philippines, a lot of the sand goes, a lot of the beaches, yeah. actually the resorts, they buy sand from other... Other places, yeah. So that that's something, the hydraulic modeling and the sediment and transport modeling for, for the sand and the fines, that's something has, that has to be considered in the design process. <laughs> I didn't know this is a whole business, like all the fancy yeah. resorts in my, in mm -hmm. the Sil Island in Mactan, all the sand is bought and sometimes people steal sand and sell sand. It's ridiculous. <laughs> It is. <laughs> yeah, so we we worked with marine engineers and divers to really check what was underneath so we can add this kind of concrete th 
everything so that the sand can get redirected in one area. It's a, is that a, what a waterfront architect yep. does? So I wouldn't say we're the, I mean, we have marine engineers, we have a professional engineer diver that'll go down and inspect and, you know, we'll, we'll fly a drone to see if, if we don't have a diver to see what's going on below the water surface. Uh, but certainly we can look at how coastlines naturally and after catastrophes, um, you know, what the differences are and what the natural transport is of if a jetty needs to be made to protect so that there's not as harsh of a wave climate or if we need wave attenuators or a wave screen. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of considerations as well as the navigability and the maneuvering of vessels. You know, your services will really do really well in Asia, specifically in in Thailand and the Philippines when there's all that you know development in five star resorts. I mean, it's just amazing. They transform this the place with all this new sand, but they don't have to bring sand in. You can actually redesign the underwater structure, right? Right. So you can move sand around naturally. Another question, how did you or when did you launch Indigo River and what point did you realize you wanted to go on your own and what's what does Indigo River mean? Sure. So I worked in a couple other firms um, and also had a short stint outside of the industry entirely. Um, but it was in 2018 that we launched Indigo River. And it was after I had worked at several different engineering and contracting firms, um, often as a prime, and observed some of the certainly government programs and incentive programs for women and minority-owned business, for veteran-owned businesses, um, and saw what what kind of, in, in some ways, the competition was out there. Um, just as as far as women-owned businesses and also understood what having an area of specialties meant for for me and for our team that we've grown Um, and so it was 2018 that we officially launched but I was I was thinking about it for a year 18 months kind of in advance in the back of my head I was also working on my architecture licensure um, and I had worked also in some toxic environments that I had decided I'd looked for a period of time and I decided I, I didn't want to work in a, in a toxic environment and if I couldn't find what I was looking for and that to, to create it. Um, and so that was kind of the spirit behind Indigo River was finding what I couldn't or creating what I couldn't find. So why Indigo River? It's a very nice name. Thank you. Well, it was originally intended as a uh, kind of a temporary name and my husband was helping me with the Department of State filing for the paperwork and getting the getting the entity set up. Uh, and he had been asking me for a while, well, what are you going to name it? What are you going to name it? And I didn't know. And he said, well, just give me a temporary name. What's look on your phone. Like what's the last picture on your phone? And my dog, I have a, I have two dogs, but one of them uh, is named Indigo. And the last picture on my phone was Indigo and the river. And my dog is a water dog and she loves the river and she loves swimming. And so it was kind of in the spirit of that, that it was something that made me happy. It's something that makes her happy. And it has kind of a mercurial abstract feel to it that I felt could be applied and, and interpreted in different ways, which I liked. <laughs> What a great story. <laughs> Thank you. What's the most difficult part of being an entrepreneur as a woman in this male-dominated profession? Like, I've never met anyone who does what you do. So there's certainly a piece about, you know, not being heard. Um, and that's, I mean, that could be qu taken quite literally, that sometimes when I'm in a group um, and I'm the only woman at the table, I, I find I, I get more a better response when I even lower the pitch of my voice. It's almost like the frequency of my natural voice doesn't even resonate, which is frustrating. Um, but there is there is a part about kind of speaking up and with conviction, stating, knowing what I want to say and saying it, um, saying what I mean and meaning what I say. And there's a part about the delivery of making sure that it lands and that I am heard. And so that that can be a challenge. And yeah, one of my go-tos is to quite literally, whether I realize it or not, I've been told that I do it, but sometimes it does mean me kind of lowering the pitch of my voice to have um, have it land and have it resonate. That's a new, that's new. <laughs> I mean, I could actually relate. If I talk to someone with a really high pitch voice, it's, <laughs> it's hard for you to get taken, you know, taken seriously, right? But if you talk, like if you listen to news anchors, they're very yes, kind of monotone in their delivery. Yeah. And I um, I don't think that I have a, a necessarily a high pitched voice to begin with. But uh, for whatever reason, it's the, the frequency that resonates more, more successfully. So I think I'll try to do that as well, because I tend to <laughs> giggle a lot in my podcast. So um, I'll try to be more, you know, low pitched. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you find your clients as, you know, business development, like, I mean, it seems like most of the clients that you have are 
or the work is all government or how does that work? We actually we have a pretty healthy split, um, which certainly we appreciate having a diverse portfolio of both public and private clients. Uh, and, and the range of our projects can you know, be anywhere from a, an entire New York City municipal pier or a backyard in the suburbs that someone you know, needs to rebuild their seawall or wants a, a dock to enable recreational access to the river, to the water body. Um, so it really, it really changes and the, our clients change, which I actually is one of the things that I appreciate is working with different clientele because it's not always that we're working certainly with government, with municipalities or with agencies or with, uh, you know, peer consultant groups and engineers. Uh, but I find talking to, you know, homeowners that know nothing about necessarily, you know, the waterfront or the infrastructure, there's a way that it kind of regrounds me. Um, and helps me reframe what I, what it is that I'm delivering, what it is that they're asking for, what the impact is that they're looking for. So yeah, have a have a range of different clients, and and also the diverse portfolio certainly helps um, in times of uncertainty, as we experienced during the pandemic. There was a, a moment of uh oh, what's what's going to happen? And certainly, some of our public clients did put work on hold, and not necessarily that um, it didn't pick up. It did pick up again, thankfully. Uh, but there was you know there were other priorities in in dealing with, intending to, and Uh, managing the response for the pandemic. Wow. So for a residential client, for instance, you will have a homeowner with a lake house, for example. And then, I mean, how does that work if you're trying to get residential or how do the residential clients find you? What type of what's your typical scope? I'm just I just want to know. Sure. So I well, I actually I live on the waterfront um, in Rockland County and um, through word of mouth and also through contractors that we work with. Oftentimes, I feel like the most exposure that um, the waterfront will get is when there's a contractor working on site and that'll kind of raise the eyebrows of neighbors and they'll see something going on and they'll go and oftentimes approach the contractor and say, Hey, I want to, I want to dock too, or I want to see while my wall is failing. And the contractors who we have a great relationship with and we, we work with on other projects as well, will often give a couple names and ours will be one of them. And then it's a matter of meeting with the homeowner and understanding what it is that they think that they want and advising them on on what we think they they need um, and kind of working through that process. And that can be, like I said, that can be a seawall, it can be a riprap, it can be, you know, soft edge, um, and, and it can be a recreational dock or a kayak launch um, and into whether it's a river or a lake or whatever water body. Uh, and, there, and there's a lot of nuance with, um, you know, as of right, who owns the lands underwater and the, the permitting process, the joint permit application that goes to many different parties at the, the state and federal level, as well as, you know, on the local municipal level. So there's a lot to navigate that. I think if I hadn't, you know, worked on the waterfront before, I would certainly, um, you know, try and get into it and be intimidated by just the, the range of different, you know, regulatory and agencies having jurisdiction that do exist on the waterfront. Is there a course on waterfront architecture or how did you learn? I mean, is it by experience or did you actually go to school? No, I mean, largely, this. largely experienced, but there are there are certainly design themes that carry throughout. And I mean, licensed as an architect to protect the health, safety and welfare in the built environment and the waterfront often is a built environment. And so I I look to assert my agency, maybe in a less traditional sense, but certainly on, on the waterfront. Um, and there are themes now, particularly within, um, you know, climate adaptation, resiliency, sustainability that go hand in hand with how we execute on the waterfront. And so. Uh, while I never necessarily, you know, took a Waterfront 101 design course um, experience, as, as well as, you know, just general continuing education. I do a lot of continuing education that isn't actually, um, you know, rated by AIA or, or NCARB, but it's, you know, more for probably my engineering peers, but it applies to what I do and I, I learn from it and I enjoy it and I'm able to um, kind of absorb it and, and put it through my own lens of, you know, as an architect practicing on the waterfront. So you mentioned earlier about sustainability and resiliency. And you, you also mentioned that these two terms are commonly or frequently misunderstood. Can you shed some light on that? Yeah, I um, I observe pretty frequently that even, even architects, engineers, um, agencies that are putting on RFPs will almost use the terms uh, interchangeably. And they well related, they're not the same thing. And usually the way that I kind of explain the difference is that they're the inverse of each other. So with sustainability, we look at humankind's impact on the natural environment. And in resiliency, we look at the environment, the natural environment's impact on the built world. Uh, so certainly they are related, and especially when you kind of zoom out in the, the scale of time and you consider 
benefit or the the life cycle impacts of a project and you assess you know the full picture of, of what a project really is um you know resulting in they are linked but they are not the same and oftentimes most often i mean i'm very passionate about sustainability of course but uh more often in my work on the waterfront because it is typically a vulnerable zone that's most exposed to, you know, natural threats and hazards. Um, I find myself looking for and designing for resiliency as a kind of a, a key theme. And that's, a, you know, under the umbrella of climate adaptation and just how we have to um, be thinking not only of the, you know, the client and what they're asking for here and now, but the life cycle of whatever the asset is or the infrastructure is um, and, you know, future generations that will be able to use it. That's really important. So can you tell us about Indigo at River and your s different types of services that you offer? Sure. So we, um, I mean, we are registered within New York and, and elsewhere. Most of our work is in New York Harbor and we offer, uh, again, classify kind of waterfront architecture, not traditional architecture, um, but waterfront architecture with themes of, you know, resiliency and resiliency assessments and vulnerability assessments and cost and life benefit or um, life cycle and cost benefit analyses for different projects. And then the softer side of the skills, um, we have the environmental permitting, the, the regulatory review, um, scheduling, sequencing, cost estimating, all centered around the waterfront. And many of our uh, team members have certainly worked not only in the design side, but on the contractor side as well. So that, you know, means and me methods of, you know, constructability, how will this get built is really ingrained in everyone's head. Um, and then on the engineering side, we have the marine engineering and the coastal engineering. Um, so structures on the waterfront, again, that could be a bulkhead, that could be a marina, it could be a port facility, it could be a ferry landing. Um, and, and the two really go hand in hand because we've seen where, you know, the architect will design what the architect wants to see and the engineer will get it and kind of redesign it based on the engineering standards. And when the, the two aren't overlaid or there isn't that collaboration internally, um, th there can be, you know, bits and pieces that get lost. So we enjoy having that collaboration internally and certainly extending and pulling in, um, you know, peripheral team members, whether it's a ecologist or landscape architect or whoever that we need uh, to round out our team. That's great. So just out of curiosity, what type of software do you use for like waterfront architecture? Is there a particular one that is specific to the trade? Uh, no, I mean, we have an array of different softwares that we use depending on the, the application, but uh, certainly we use CAD, we use Revit, we use Rhino, we use Orca for floating structures. So it, uh, it really depends on the application. Uh, we're not doing so much, you know, sediment, sediment transport modeling in-house. We usually will bring someone in for that, but there are, you know, an array of other softwares that are intended specifically for that. Yeah, I know nowadays there's a <laughs> software for everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can't keep so, up with them all. <laughs> yeah. So what are your exciting projects in the pipeline? So we have kind of a, I mean, we have some traditional projects that were on call for Governor's Island, which is very exciting. Um, we have... Uh, uh, you know, Battery Park City, where we're on site for the construction manager, uh, Eastside Coastal Resiliency, again, a lot of resiliency themed work. And we stage, we help with the staging on the, you know, resiliency aspects for, you know, what comes and goes by water. Um, Harlem River Greenway, rebuilding the entire north area of Manhattan on the waterfront. So there are old structures that have kind of gone derelict in different ways. And so we uh, are assisting the design team who's laying in engineers on the the permitting and the environmental impacts for the different improvements that are proposed. Um, and we have a, a, a handful of New York State parks projects upstate that vary in, you know, what uh, what is being done, but it's really nice to be able to go to work and be on the water or be in the state park. It's certainly a nice area. Um, and then something that we're doing that's uh, newer and kind of exciting in a, in a different way is not something that we've done before and it's our role within the offshore wind emerging industry in new york and we are um, working with the new york city economic development corporation on a mentorship program particularly for women and minority-owned businesses and how they'll um, you know be in the pipeline and be working on offshore wind projects um, so that's certainly something that's exciting and within that we have a training school that we've franchised and are looking to launch to help with the workforce development within um, the new york metro area so we meaning Indigo River has a training school? Indigo River is part of a joint venture that has launched a training school, yes. <laughs> wow. I feel like we need another podcast just for that. <laughs> Certainly. Can you talk a little can you talk about that a little bit? 
Uh, sure. So there are some ambitious and and rightfully so goals that and targets that have been set both by the federal and by state um, state entities for offshore wind and renewable energy. Um, and for those to be met, we there, there's frankly there's a gap in the workforce right now. And even if we were to look to you know take labor from from abroad, whether Europe or elsewhere, that maybe has the skilled labor. Um, frankly, there's just there's not enough. So there's really a need for uh, an expertise to be developed within offshore wind, both for the, the construction as well as for the waterfront, um, for the construction of the pipeline of the waterfront services that are kind of ancillary to the offshore industry. Um, so that's something that's emerging and kind of where we've identified it because we're we're in the middle of it. We see that interface of what's coming and and what we have or what we don't have. And so uh, helping to build the pipeline and really focusing on um, amplifying and getting, you know, women and minority businesses into that queue early on. So that's a very strategic move as well as, a you know, for a business owner. Mm -hmm. In my business, we do architecture, drafting, and support. Mm -hmm. I'm also tapping the schools in the Philippines and trying to train them at the university level so that when they, they're out of college, they're hireable because, you know, there's a shortage of staff all over. Yep. So that's great that you're, you have your own school, that you can, mm -hmm. you know, you're building the pipeline so they can work with you in the future or whoever. What are your hobbies or do you have time for hobbies? <laughs> Uh, no, so I mean, hobbies are so important to just change headspace. I certainly during the pandemic took up yoga. I had done it before. I had a shoulder injury and I, uh, for a period of time, couldn't or wasn't safe to, you know, even go to the physical therapist. And so I was looking for ways at home to to heal and yoga became one of them. And so I've, I've gotten more and more into yoga. I, um, I mean, outside of the pandemic, I love to travel and enjoy traveling. I feel like seeing new culture just kind of stretches the creative muscles to you know not take things for granted or the way that you know we grew up to see them it's so nice to see different cultures doing different things and, and learn from it um i do live on the hudson and i do love to paddleboard so that's kind of my connection with the water if i can get up early and go for a sunrise paddle i absolutely will um and i am a peloton fan so i love cycling um really appreciated that particularly i, I my husband got my peloton for me before the pandemic and um just just in time because i feel like there was then a, a rush to get them and they were kind of back ordered for a while but certainly appreciated throughout the pandemic having a, a sense of community just from uh, through exercise as an outlet oh i love peloton i have like <laughs> two favorite um instructors robin arzan and love her. The other, and the girl with the curly hair who just got married uh ali yeah, Ali I know love. their life story, <laughs> Ali Love, because I I've been following them since yep. like maybe fifteen years already. Yeah, they're great. Ro Ro Robin was an attorney, and then she moved to a different career. I love like, it, love that. Yeah, she successful in her own right, and just pivoted and went into something completely different and able to apply people her are like, <laughs> they're like, how do you even know th about them? I'm like, well, I follow them. Like, <laughs> Ali just got married. <laughs> yeah, Robin had a baby. Figures. Gotta appreciate yeah. your social media family, the extension, the community. <laughs> exactly, and it's very inspiring, especially for people who wanna who've invested so much time in in law, and then they're just they become yeah. uh, exercise gurus, and now kind of like celebrity levels, right? Absolutely. So, what is your advice for aspiring entrepreneurs who are not ready to take the leap but are thinking about it? Listen to your gut. Um, you you have, I'm sure, if you're if you're thinking about it. Um, start lining up, you know, actionable steps and not, not that you should be scared to take the leap, but uh, as much as you can do kind of on your own on the side before you fully launch, the better off you'll be. Um, but listen to your intuition. And if it's, if it's, you know, reminding you and, and persistent and, and directing you toward a certain path, um, it's probably for a reason. <laughs> That's true. I never heard that before. Listen to your gut. But that it's absolutely right. And a lot of people, you know, burn out and they just, you know, I think that's what they do to become really successful. So what's next for Dina and where what, where do you see yourself in three years? Oh, uh, what's next for me? Well, probably a vacation, to be honest. <laughs> uh, been a while as we bogged down during the pandemic and didn't travel for a while and now travel has picked up for conferences and things but not necessarily for personal so my husband and i are looking forward to taking our first vacation just for us in, in a very long time far too long um and in three years where are we in three years 2025 so we'll be in the thick of offshore wind so I, i'd love to see you know a couple classes having graduated out in the workforce and 
um, knowing that, you know, we played a part in their career and their trajectory and within, you know, the, the goals for renewable energy at large. Thank you. So where can we find you online? Uh, so online, we have our website, website which is indigoriver.com, um, certainly through there or through LinkedIn, um, just under my name, Dina Prastos, and on Instagram, I'm fairly active, just again, my name, Dina Prastos. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dina. I really enjoyed our conversation. Me too. Thank you for having me, Aya. That was Dina Prastos of Indigo River. Thanks for listening to this episode of Architect My Life, a podcast brought to you by the MGS Global Group. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you would like to add to the conversation through your own experiences, I encourage you to be a guest on one of our upcoming episodes. Visit architectmylife.com slash apply to learn how. I firmly believe that a strong community drives change and fosters success. If you'd like to be part of this community, join the all-female Architect My Life Facebook group. Please take a moment to review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at Aya underscore Architect My Life and Architect My Life podcast. Thanks again for listening. I'm Aya Schlachter. Until next time.